last program of the day on what has been an epic day of five programs, and I'm just giddy with excitement. We've got one of my very favorite speakers of all time. We've got teachers with great ties. We've got just, it's a really great time for everyone. So a big welcome into all of you. And Jill, your dance moves were incredible. So thank you for that very much as well. Now, a uh, professional hat on. Uh, if you're new to us here at Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants, we're all about bringing conservation, adventure, and science into classrooms around the world. We did 32 programs in September alone. We are kicking off October with a bang. It has been an incredible week. Today alone, we've hung out talking about the James Webb Space Telescope. We've been off the coast of the Galapagos talking about their vertical cold water reefs. We went to a forest in Newfoundland to talk about restoring it, and we just wrapped up with Victoria Arbor in BC talking about dino fossil hunting. It has been an incredible ride, epitomizing exactly what we're all about here as an organization, and you can check out all those programs at our YouTube channel too. Lots of opportunity to learn about any topic in the world. I really encourage you to check it out. Now today, I am so thrilled to welcome back wildly accomplished, comically accomplished Jill Heinert, probably the most uh, amazing person that we ever have on the broadcast, joining us for, I think, the 25th, 30th time, something like that. She is soon to be the re very well-deserved re recipient of an honorary doctorate at my alma mater, Victoria College of the University of Toronto. Uh, she is the world's greatest living diver. She's uh, an author, both of adult and kids' books. You can check out all her work on IntoThePlanet.com, all her past broadcasts with us on our YouTube channel and more. I'm so excited for you all to meet her. You're in for such a treat. Without further ado, Jill Heinerth, welcome back to the broadcast. And uh, hey. so nice to see you again. <laughs> Thanks. It's great to be with you. Boy, if I can't like like tap into your enthusiasm, then I'll be set for life. <laughs> I, it's the, I have the best job in the world. I get to hang out with people like you all day long and make sure kids get to learn about some really amazing stuff. So a big thank you to Mr. Shattuck, Ms. Swangs, to Ms. Lango's class joining us live, YouTube classes. And Jill, if you want to take us away, the yeah. art and science of cave diving. Yeah, you bet. All right. I'm so excited to be here with you today and share a little bit about my life as a cave diver. And so I'm going to take you around the world and the different types of work that I do and talk also a little bit about what I call the exploration mindset. So I am from Ontario. I know there's a few people on the call here from Ontario today, too. I grew up in what is now Mississauga. It wasn't even Mississauga back then, but, um, but I have always been a lover of the water. But when I was a little kid in kindergarten, we were watching some really special stuff on TV at school. We didn't have this kind of an interconnection, but we did have live views of watching men land on the surface of the moon and drive little lunar rovers. And I got to tell you, that's what made me want to be an explorer, seeing that and looking at these astronauts and saying, I could do that. <laughs> but at the time, we did not have a Canadian space program, and there were also no women astronauts. So I ended up going to inner space instead of outer space. But there's a lot of things about inner space that are pretty similar, like the kind of equipment that I have to use for life support. So I have to carry everything that I need to breathe on my dives in the same way that an astronaut needs to carry their life support equipment when they're in a spacesuit too. So some pretty advanced stuff that lets me go deeper and further into the planet than people have been before. But that's not the end of the heavy stuff that I have to drag around the world. I end up, you know, carrying just huge quantities of tanks and dive gear and cameras and everything in order to do my work. And um, as you can see, there's uh, a lot of equipment, sometimes several hundred pounds of equipment. I work in teams quite often. But sometimes I'm working all on my own. But the teams are necessary for some of the really, you know, high tech missions that I'm on. As I travel around the world, you might find me underneath the ice in the Arctic or maybe even on top of the ice. So this is on top of the Northwest Passage where my colleagues and I are camping and then we're filming underneath that sea ice. But you might just as likely find me um, in the middle of the jungle in Mexico, dragging tanks out on burrows to get to cave diving sites, or even in places where you don't think that people dive. Like in the Sahara Desert, there are actually places for me to dive in the Sahara Desert. 
like if you ever wondered like what was inside an oasis where little palm trees grow um then that's where i'm diving in the sahara desert now you'll also find me on shipwrecks down in the south pacific um so inside these ships in this case that went down in world war ii now, I also do a little bit of teaching, uh, a very specialized teaching of people like this. This is this is James Cameron. He uh, uh, needed some help. Uh, he wanted to do his first cave dives, and I got to take him on those very first cave dives. And like James Cameron, you know, I'm lugging camera equipment through these environments. But I also get a chance to... Um, interact with some pretty amazing animals too like whale sharks in mexico or giant mobile arrays in the middle of the atlantic ocean in the azores or even a beautiful manatee and her baby at a place called crystal river in florida so i have quite a lot of variety in the type of work i do and the places that i get to go but my specialty is underwater cave systems. And a lot of people are like, what, what is that? Well, these are water filled spaces inside the planet where I'm swimming through like the, the equivalent of like branching conduits, like the same way a tree branches out, the tunnels full of water also branch in many different directions. And let me just share with you what some of these, uh, these places look like. So this, um, as you can see, there's a warning sign here, and it's because it's a black, dark environment. And the only light in this environment is the light that I bring to it. So I have many lights, in fact, in case, in case something breaks, right? I need to have a backup. And some of these spaces are small, but some spaces are really large. Like I could put your classroom or your entire school inside some of these underwater cave systems. And I like to think of these cave systems as museums of natural history. So inside these places, I can do the work for scientists who are interested in global climate change, um, scientists who are interested in the life that lives within these cave systems, and also scientists interested in ancient cultures like archaeologists and, and uh, paleontologists who find cultural assets like pottery and and other things that were intentionally left in these places when they weren't full of water so when they were dry so it's a beautiful beautiful environment that i get to work in and uh, kind of pinch myself every day when i go to work <laughs> so today i want to just highlight a couple of key expeditions that are some of my favorites and I know this one was a long time ago, but it, it has a really interesting through line in my life. So on this project in the late 1990s, I had the incredible opportunity to drive the world's first mapping device that could digitally map the cave that I was swimming through. And it was a very deep cave, a very long cave system. And this is the very first time anyone had ever made such an accurate map. This is what that mapping device looked like. And you can see I'm hanging on to it. It's kind of pulling me through the water as it's pinging the walls and making measurements and assembling a three-dimensional map inside like five computers that are inside that device. Now, this project was done with volunteers, including me. So for two years, I worked on this project because I thought it was important. And everybody here volunteered, you know, brought their own money. We all helped raise money in order to build the equipment. And we did it because we felt like it mattered. And this is an example of what we call citizen science. So nobody's paying us to do this. There's not a university that's like driving us to do this. We're chasing our own curiosity and trying to do something that pushes the envelope of exploration and discovery forward. And we had to build some pretty serious equipment to pull off these very long dives. Dives where I might be wearing 
two of these life support devices. These are called rebreathers. And besides that, I've got to carry, um, I've got to drive that mapper, that giant thing that's two meters long. And I've got to carry a backup in case the first one breaks. And then I carry a bunch of tanks and scientific equipment. And that could weigh like 250 or 300 kilograms. So a lot of stuff, but that would whisk me through the cave system, sometimes as far as three kilometers into the planet in water that's like 90 to 100 meters deep. And my mission might take as long as 22 hours. So it's almost like this was my moonshot. And it was only made possible because a lot of citizen scientists and volunteers came to help. Now, we had like divers and we had like engineers that built the mapper, we had computer programmers, but we also had people that wanted to come and kind of be a tour guide and talk to visitors at the site. We even had like people that came and volunteered to cook for us. So there were a lot of different types of people with different skills and interests that gathered together over this two year period um, to dive as much as we could. That's just to let you know that whatever you're interested in doing in life, it can be of value and of service to scientific exploration. And you might think that, wow, I don't know anything about science, right? But you can still participate in these very exciting things. And, and I think that citizen science is really important for the future as we solve some, some desperate issues that are giving us all anxiety, like water issues and climate change. So one of the coolest parts of this project that I love so much was that we had a surface tracking team. And so while I'm swimming through the cave system beneath their feet, these guys are tracking me in real time. And so they're actually like pinging or listening for a ping from this beacon that I've got inside the cave. And well, they tracked me through some pretty crazy places. Like this is just a field. But at times they had to jump into a canoe and paddle through a river because I was in an underground river beneath that river. And there were times when they tracked me like through a golf course community. <laughs> so imagine like I'm right below these guys and they're walking onto this like family's patio and they banged on the back door saying, hey, cave diving survey team, can we come in? And the poor landowner, like, like sitting in his easy boy watching TV, had no idea there were caves underneath his house. They've tracked me through bowling alleys, but my favorite is this spot. This is a Sunny's Barbecue restaurant in Alachua, Florida. And I swam like 300 feet underneath this restaurant, underneath the salad bar. <laughs> And that's pretty crazy because if these guys are like running through the restaurant with all their survey gear, I mean, you can see the man at the back of the salad bar there just kind of going, what's going on? <laughs> so water moves through the planet, sometimes in spaces that I can swim through. But if I can't swim through that space, the water still travels from higher elevations to lower elevations. So rainfall that happens in the mountains soaks into the ground and moves down in between the soil and sand and slowly, because of gravity, like moves its way towards lower spaces and maybe pops out in a, in a spring. So, you know, wherever you live, if it's New Jersey, Ohio, Ontario, Alberta, you know, Manitoba or Quebec, no matter where you live, even if you're nowhere close to a big body of water, you are connected to keeping that water clean because everything you do on the surface of the earth can soak into the ground and end up in a cave system where I might be swimming. But even if I don't fit, like I said, that water still travels laterally through the environment, just like a river travels on the surface, underground rivers will surface too. And we need to understand where that water comes from, how we can keep it clean and protect it for future generations, because it's really important that water is equally available, healthy, clean drinking water for everybody on the planet, because then we'll be living in a peaceful world if everybody has what they need. So 
when I'm swimming inside a cave, we can think of that as the beginning of the pipe, right? But that cave might come out of the ground. The water comes out of the cave and spills into a spring like this. And that spring may lead to a little creek and then a river with beautiful subaquatic vegetation in it. And that's all like healthy, healthy stuff for habitat and nutrition for the fish and also for manatees like this mama and baby manatee. But they really want to live in a river that looks like this with all that healthy nutrition rather than one like this that doesn't have much growing on the bottom. So when our water systems get out of balance, then we can have things like algae blooms. And you can see this icky, icky, stinky green water. And when we have an algae bloom, we can have basically an ecosystem collapse, like things that live in this water basically suffocate because the algae uses up all of that oxygen. So understanding those pathways for water is really important because then we can see that maybe something like a farm that used too much fertilizer and that soaked into the ground and came out into the water, that fertilizer could have caused something like this algae bloom. Now, let me take you back to that mapping device again, because that helps us to know where the water systems are underneath the surface of the earth, where the big ones are. Well, today, like now more than 25 years later, the device looks like that little orange thing over there in the photo, the Sunfish Mapper. And that mapper is an artificially intelligent robot. So it can think on its own and it travels into the cave. We can even tell it to find a cave for us. And it swims into the cave with little thrusters and then it starts to map on its own. Now we can actually plug a wire into the back of it and we can watch how it's thinking and how it's making choices. And that's what you see trailing out of the tail there, but we're not sending it commands. So it's driving through the system. And when it gets to a point where there's a tunnel here and a tunnel there, it will make a choice and explore that tunnel and ping the walls and start measuring, measuring the distance from where it is to the wall. And as it goes, it knows how to conserve its resources. It turns around, it looks, it films. And here it's just looking at this, this pillar and it's trying to decide whether to go right or left. And when we have a tether attached, we can see how it's thinking. And so here it does a barrel roll and it paints basically all the walls and the ceiling and the floor. Now this particular device can go to places that I can't go to in dirty water, deeper water, stay down longer because it doesn't need to breathe, right? But its ultimate mission is to go into space, to go to Jupiter's moon, Europa. And that's incredible because this thing is going to explore a liquid ocean beneath the frozen surface of Europa. So will it find life? Maybe. Will it find caves? Hmm, maybe. <laughs> but I'm just as excited to see what Europa might look like. So it's a huge opportunity to be involved in these kinds of explorations. But there's one thing that I want to let you know. I'm not some adrenaline junkie that like likes to be scared. I'm like, I'm scared every time I go diving. I'm not fearless, right? People think I'm fearless because of some of the crazy places I've been like inside of icebergs, right? But I'm not fearless. I do things that are dangerous, right? But I do them thoughtfully. I assess the risk. I figure out all the things that can go wrong when I've got to jump in the water with a polar bear or jump into a bloom of jellyfish. So I think about all of those risks before I go underwater so that when I go underwater, I can just focus on the job at hand and I can make good choices to move forward. And that's where that exploration mindset comes in. So explorers um, understand risk, but then they choose to act because it's something that matters. 
and they always remember the safety protocols that they decided on and they stay within that lane because I don't believe that there's such a concept as failure. So if you failed a test, it's okay. It's not the end of the world, right? You will learn something from that experience. You will learn the answers of, to the things that you got wrong in that test. You might go back for a little bit more like remedial learning to make sure you understand the concepts that you didn't understand before, but it's all part of a development process. You might've even learned that, wow, I should have studied, right? <laughs> and when you move forward next time, you're armed with that new information. So I look at the word failure and I really think it should be discovery learning because you discover something from messing up, right? I mean, the first, you know, invention of the light bulb didn't happen on the very first try. There were lots of failures or discovery learning opportunities until it worked. So stay with it and continue, continue to work hard at those things that you're interested in and be willing to get a little scared and step into the darkness because that's where your opportunity is to be an explorer and learn something new for yourself or maybe even something completely new for humanity. So I think we should open this up for some questions and I will try and like hit some pictures with the questions as we go along. You're the best person at doing that of anyone we've ever had on. So I'm excited for these queries to lead us where we may with some of your amazing uh, adventures. But thank you so much for that incredible 20 minute lead into the work that you've had the chance to do. Mm -hmm. um, as Jill said, we're gonna dive into the Q&A. If you're on YouTube and you wanna share any there, please do, I'd love to take as many as possible. But I'm gonna start in Deep River with our grade five sixes, Mr. Shannon's class, take us away and uh, go for it. Hey. How do you survive the cold water? How do you survive? Mm, the that's a great question. So as you can imagine, when I'm diving in um, the Arctic or in the Antarctic on some really long dives, right? It's really cold. In fact, water that I dive in like here can be uh, minus uh, two degrees Celsius, right? So it can be even colder when it's salt water. So I wear a dry suit that seals around my neck and around my wrists and I should stay dry in there, but I wear a lot of insulating underwear underneath that dry suit. And so it, um, it it's kind of like putting on like a snowmobile suit. Um, and then um, that, that's for the insulation part and then putting a waterproof suit on top of that. So it's a lot of gear. Now, deep river, like deep river near, near Ottawa. They're right down the road. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, cool. All right. Because I'm headed up onto the Ottawa River tonight to do some more of my uh, my work there in the caves. <laughs> Pretty cool. We've done whole broadcasts on the work on the diving that's near there. So I just wanted to highlight for you guys, if you're ever keen on diving, Jill's like done some incredible stuff, like really close to you guys, which is super cool. So great question. Yeah, that's the longest underwater cave system there. <laughs> of course. Of course it is. Very, very cool. Um, Miss Swang's Juice Glass, Oregon, Ohio. If you guys want to unmute your mic, uh, we'd love to come on in for the second time today. So nice to have you guys back. Miss Lango's class, I'm coming to you guys in a second as well. Let's head to uh, Ohio first. Sorry, come on in. Okay, go ahead, Natalie. Ask your question. What What's the biggest fish you've seen? And um, have you seen any new plants or animals that no one has seen? Oh, yeah. Great question. So, yes, I often work on teams that are looking at the biology in underwater caves, which and the biology in underwater caves is crazy stuff like this. Uh, but they're small, uh, but they're really interesting. So we have cave adapted shrimp. We have cave adapted fish and they have no eyes and uh, no pigment. Um, but this is my favorite one. And we've discovered some new species of this animal called remipede. So no eyes, no pigment, but he has venomous fangs and pincers and can attack something 40 times its size. And then it can inject it with venom, turn the guts into jello, and then suck the life out of it over time. So cave animals are cool. <laughs> 
I just want to say, so I'm a biologist by background. I love all creatures. The only thing I don't like is centipedes. They're like not my favorite thing because I find them really weird with it moving. But rentipedes are amazing. It's like the same motion, uh, but in the water, it's mesmerizing and beautiful. Yeah, so. they're just little. They're tiny yeah. little things. But I was on a team that discovered a new subspecies of killer whale in Antarctica, though, too. So that's the biggest one. <laughs> yeah, that is the biggest one. Hard to beat yeah. a new whale. Subspecies. Yeah, that's pretty. There's a little wiggle room above that. Um, Miss Langos class, I'm going to head to you guys in just a sec if you want to unmute your mic. And then Miss Nicholson, Altona, Manitoba, I'm so excited to take your questions from YouTube and a big welcome to you guys. But Miss Lango, come on in and take us away. Hi, guys. Welcome into New Jersey. Yeah, hi, Kayla. <laughs> nice and loud. Do you ever feel like you're going to run out of air or get stuck in tiny places? Ooh, Ooh good questions. So, yeah, some caves are really, really small. Um, but... I have at least two of everything I need, but oftentimes I have three of everything I need. So I always take three times as much gas like to breathe that I need. And that's so there's one third for me to go into the cave. There's one third to come out of the cave and there's one third for me for emergencies or to share with somebody else. So we, we plan these things all in advance and we do all our safety checks before we go down so that we're confident that even if something happens, we have a backup. Yeah. I really like that you mentioned this and I love that you focus on the prep that goes into this work. I literally use you as an example verbally in a lot of the broadcast just to highlight the fact that when it comes to something like this, it can be a risky endeavor. But if you prepare, if you have that knowledge ahead of time, if you mm -hmm. only put yourselves in situations where you have some semblance of understanding of what the conditions and risks might be, I think that's a really important thing for our kids to know. So and it's the fun part of planning these things. I love that part. <laughs> <laughs> um, we're going to do another round with our live class in just a minute, but Miss Nicholson's class wants to know, now you answered this a little bit, what are some of the favorite animals you've encountered? Anything that really jumps out in your time? Polar bears. <laughs> so being in the water, being the first woman to swim with polar bears, that's really high on my list and scary. I don't know if I'll ever do it again, but I got to do it once. Um, but I also love walruses. This is actually a mama and two babies. And we can tell it's a mother because of her tusks pointing a little bit outward, like a male's um, walrus tusks will go straight down. But because the woman has, or the female walrus cradles her baby and also nurses, the tusks have to stick out to the side so she can hold her baby, which is so cute. Uh, but I also love sea lions because they're so curious. Like they come right up to me and um, even like a whole pack of them will swim right up to me as soon as I as soon as I jump in the water, they're super, super curious and they actually like to play with us. So I love all these big animals, but I do also love the little things too. Like everything that's coating these rocks, those are actually animals. So um, they're stuck in place. They stay still for their whole life, but they're actually animals. So there's so much to see underwater. Very cool. Jill, that final picture, is that, where is that? Is that the West Coast? Yes, that last one was the West Coast. Yeah, cool. and the sea lines too. Yeah, Very nice. BC. Uh, really quick, easy one is a nice follow up. I want to get as many from Manitoba in as possible. Mm -hmm. How long have you been doing this? Ah, well, mm, boy, more than 35 years, I guess, 8,000 dives. So, um, oh. I've been busy. <laughs> You've been busy. You finish the broadcast, you go straight out to dive. So that's a testament to your... Yeah, that's, yeah, that's what I'm doing right after. <laughs> um, Deep River, we're going to head back to you guys, Mr. Shadow's class. Come on back in and take us away. Hey. What's the most dangerous uh, shipwreck you've been to? Ooh. Ah, that's an interesting question. The most dangerous shipwreck. Well, what's interesting about shipwrecks is when... Um, when they sink down to um, the bottom, they they become like artificial reefs. So they get covered with with life, which is which is quite beautiful. Like these are shipwrecks in Newfoundland, and you can see. But what you can see here is that there used to be a deck here. This is the back deck, and that's actually a defensive gun because this was a, a World War II era shipwreck, and. All the metal parts last for a long time. The wood kind of dissolves away and gets eaten by um, worms and stuff. Um, but eventually, as it rusts and rusts, um, then the metal starts to fall apart too. And so if you go inside some of these shipwrecks, um, it, it can start to get 
dangerous, especially if you're making bubbles and the bubbles are rising up and and hitting the ceiling, causing things to to come down. Um, so I guess every shipwreck is and every cave, they're all dangerous. And so I always have to be kind of, uh, you know, thoughtful about the places that I'm swimming through and how I'm going to get out and and what are you know what are my alternatives if uh, if I'm for some reason trapped, right? Um, but it's it's kind of fun to uh, to see these places because uh, because they tell us a lot about history. They do. The shipwreck imagery is just so beautiful. I'm a biologist by background, and I still think the shipwreck stuff is like the coolest thing that you get the chance to do. Mm. It's very very neat. Yeah. Ohio, Miss Wang's here's class. I'm going to head back to you guys, Miss Lango. I'm coming to you right after, I promise. Uh, but if you want to unmute at Jerusalem Elementary, you are good to go. Come on in. Go ahead, Brandon. How do you dive in a desert? Ah, a good question. How do you dive in a desert? So I did some reading about the Sahara Desert, and I learned that there is an aquifer beneath it. So an aquifer is when water is kind of like stored underground in natural spaces. And so I wanted to go to the Sahara Desert and, and see what that was. So let me show you an example of a dive site. So here, this is in the middle of the Sahara Desert, like on the border between Egypt and Libya. And about 40 years ago, some Russians went to this part of the desert when it looked more like this, and they started drilling and looking for oil, thinking they would find oil underground, but they didn't find oil, they found water. <laughs> and the water sprung up like a geyser um, from the well, and it created this giant lake in the desert, but the water was kind of salty, and the desert's very hot, so the sun made the water evaporate and become extra salty, or what we call hyper saline. Now, what I'm doing here, I'm laying on the ground there and my partner's like standing up. The surface here is actually a combination of mud and salt that's all dried up from the sun causing this evaporation. And so it's created like a crust, almost like if you were walking on an, a frozen lake, except this is like salt and mud. And I'm looking down into this blue hole where the water is still springing up from the aquifer below. And then we're planning to go diving in that to see what's in this hypersaline lake. So that's how we dive in the desert. Yeah, I think that's still my favorite image. Uh, this one's very cool too, but it's the you peering into this hole in the middle of the desert. It's just wild. Like it's so, so cool. Yeah. Uh, great question, guys. Miss Lango's class heading back to uh, Burley Sheaf. Come on in, take us away. Hey. Have you ever found like really real, like really weird rock? Ooh. Oh, wow. That's cool. Yes. Um, so one of the cool places that I got to dive was inside a volcano. So in the Canary Islands, and um, that's off the coast of Africa in the Atlantic Ocean. And the volcano hadn't erupted in about 5,000 years. But just imagine when lava flows down the side of a, of a volcano, the outer side of that lava actually crusts. So it, it dries up and cools off first, but the lava inside the tube keeps on flowing. And so when the volcano stops erupting, we end up with what were what are called lava tubes because the lava flowed through and kept on going, but there's this like crusty pipe basically of rock. And that rock looks so strange. I find that to be a really, really interesting place because when I'm swimming in lava tubes, there's places where the lava was dripping from the ceiling, creating very interesting formations. This is by complete fluke. I think the fourth time today that volcanoes and, and have been brought up in one of our broadcasts. Uh, if anyone's keen, uh, a friend of yours, colleague, someone we've had on many times as well, George Karunas did the world's weirdest <laughs> volcanoes like a month ago. It's an amazing broadcast on our YouTube channel if we've got any volcano keen kids. But I'm really, yeah. I don't think we ever had a rocks question for you ever in one of our programs, Jill. That was cool. Now, one of the coolest things that ever happened with a rock that I brought back for a geologist was I was off Bermuda doing the deepest manned dives in Bermuda's history. And I brought back a rock from 460 feet deep, so like 140 meters deep. And about a month after I brought back this rock for the geologist, I got a phone call. 
And he said, Jill, the weirdest thing happened today. And I'm like, well, what happened? And he said, that rock, that rock that you brought me, he said this morning, like it was just sitting because we leave it in the water that it came from. And he says, it was just sitting there in the tank and I saw a little baby octopus swim out of it. <laughs> cool. How do you yeah. do that? Oh, yeah. Jill, always a cool story. Um, I'm going to take one more from YouTube and then we're going to go to Deep River one more time before we wrap up together. Time flies and you're having fun in these broadcasts, but yeah. I will note again, intotheplanet.com, lots of great opportunities to learn more about Jill and her amazing work. And if you get your Patty Bubble Maker certification, which you can do by like 10, 8, there's something at 8 that you can yeah, do. Yeah, 8. 8. So if you go become a diver, you can go hang out with Jill. She'll have her first dive with Jim Cameron in a cave and with you. It's perfect. There you go. Um, YouTube, uh, Miss uh, Nicholson's class wants to know the riskiest situation you found yourself in. Ooh, well, um, you know, back over 20 years ago, I went to Antarctica to be the first person to cave dive inside an iceberg. So this is that iceberg and uh, it is the size of Jamaica. And we went down there to be the first people to cave dive inside an iceberg. It had never been done before. So we didn't even know about the dangers that we might face. We had to make a 12 day voyage across the Southern Ocean from New Zealand just to get to this part of Antarctica. And as you can see, the seas were pretty tough. I barfed my guts out. <laughs> but once we finally got down there, um, I did indeed find iceberg cave systems that we could swim inside of. So cracks and crevices and tunnels leading through the ice. And um, it was truly some of the most extraordinary diving of my life, but perhaps the most dangerous too, because while I was inside some of these massive bodies of ice, pieces were calving away at the entrance that I had gone into. And on one dive, I came back to the entrance and it was gone and I had to find another way out. And here we're seeing what it looks like right now. Other dives, I was actually trapped inside the iceberg because of the strength of the current that I couldn't even swim against. So it was a pretty crazy environment, but we found some amazing stuff. We found life inside the ice and underneath the icebergs and some pretty cool animals, as well as that uh, confirming that new uh, subspecies of killer whale in that same project. So I would say dangerous is um, yeah. diving inside an iceberg. <laughs> so Jill, I don't think we've talked about this particular expedition before you and I, I don't think I've ever seen the footage of it. Um, so many things to unpack from this. Braveheart is the name of the ship is amazing. Yeah. Uh, water coming over the bow and the guys are like a frozen beer just straight out of the time that it was filmed. But the best part of that by far, which our kids won't have a context for this, but the guy in the Zodiac that goes straight over the bird. Uh -huh. <laughs> it was never, a, a jet like, boat. And every I, time that little segment shows in the movie, I hear people going, woohoo. Yeah, what, what is that? It's hilarious. Huh. Anyway, thank you for that, my day. That was glorious. Um, Mr. Shadow's class, I'm going to wrap up with one more from you for the local context and uh, come on in and take us away, guys. What's the most coolest thing you've ever seen underwater? Coolest oh, thing ever, oh, Jill. Oh. No pressure at all. <laughs> That's so hard to choose, but I, I'm going to choose this because this is in your neighborhood. <laughs> so I'm going to say this cave that I'm working on right now in the Ottawa River is really cool. Like we have insects that start their life underwater by spinning feeding webs. Sometimes they leave them all over my guideline in the cave. But inside this cave, we have millions of mussels, so mollusks, shells, right? And these uh, animals actually work with fish in order to ensure their reproduction. And I just think they're so cool. Like the babies of these mussels look like this. They're little, um, like almost microscopic. And you can see on the picture that's right above my head here, um, when um, the mussel wants to start a new colony, because mussels don't move around too much, they actually like, shoot their babies into the mouth of fish and then the babies actually act like little vampires and and grab onto um, the fish's gills and suck the blood from the fish to feed for a period of time um, before they start their life as juveniles. So I think those mussels in the Ottawa River caves are some of the coolest, coolest things.
I love the local connection, Jill. This was so much fun as always. And again, all our classics can check out your other broadcasts on our YouTube channel. Just type in Jill's name. You'll see tons of other things she's done with us. Into the planet.com for so much more. A big kudos on behalf of the entire student audience on your upcoming honorary doctorate. Well deserved. So excited to get to head to Toronto for that. And as you well know, what we do to wrap up every program, I'm going to bring in all our classes to say a big thank you and farewell. Mr. Shadditch's class, Ms. Lango's class, Ms. Swangshu's class, and the everybody. Have a wonderful day, guys, and we'll see you all 